Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate the visitors. We're glad to see you in the house of God. It's a beautiful day God's given us in which to worship. And we appreciate your presence. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in. The Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. You in the radio listening audience, if you get on that phone and call a shut in friend, have them to tune in, get this hour coming up. We'd appreciate it so very much. And take your Bible now and turn to Matthew chapter, or rather, Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24, I continue on with the message I started last Sunday morning on Behold the Camels Were Coming. Now, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you tune in to this station where you're now listening, you in the radio listening audience, get our daily broadcast Monday through Saturday at 12 o'clock noon. Now, the tape today will be cassette tape number 306. Last Sunday... Tape number one on Behold the Camels Are Coming, number 305. Today is number 306. Two messages on the subject, Behold the Camels Are Coming. I want you to turn in your Bible for a verse of Scripture found in Matthew, or rather Genesis chapter 24. I can't get Matthew off my mind this morning. But it's Genesis chapter 24. I'll read a verse of Scripture, but this is a long chapter, so I won't take time to read the entire chapter. I'm only reading a verse for a text, but I want you to keep your Bible open at Genesis chapter 24 as I point out some thoughts there that you need to see. A lot of beautiful typology here in this great chapter it's impregnated with truth that we need to know and realize, and I want you to turn there. Now, I can send you a list of my cassette tape. I have 300 listed and you'd write in and get a list of our tape the tape we sent them out for a gift of three dollars each and the gift is used to help take care of our radio expense i am in need of hearing from the listening audience in regard to our radio expense and you keep that in mind if you love and appreciate this ministry and whole mission work to the glory of god and it's not a fly-by-night ministry. We're now in our 40th year of daily broadcasting from Athens. And people that love God's made it possible during these uh, 39 and uh, some few months, years. We've been on the air daily from Athens. And God has spoken to people to stand by us. God keeps the record. The treasure is laid up in heaven. You're investing in souls. You're investing in comfort and help to people in hospital, convalescents, homes, and prisons. Occasionally we get a letter from someone in jail or prison that get the broadcast, and it meant a lot to them. And many people are shut in in their homes. Multitudes of shut in people get our radio ministry on Sunday and then throughout the week. And God gave the word as great as the company of those that publish it. Therefore, we must be workers together in getting out the gospel. I can't do it alone. I must have God's people working with me. And you pray for me and write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. My Bible is opened at uh, Genesis chapter 24. On the page of the Schofield Reference Bible is page 37. I'll be reading verse 63. I would like to say that we have some of our Schofield reference Bible, King James Version, of course, 1611, have some available. And if you're thinking about getting a Bible for someone for Christmas, I can save you from 10 to $15 on the Bible. I'm not in the Bible selling business, but I order some occasionally when I can get them at a fairly good price to have available for people that's wanting to get Bibles and maybe for gifts and so forth. And what I like about the Schofield Reference Bible is that I can give you the page number, and then when you wear out one, you can get you another one, you'll find the script at the same place in the new Bible. 
I'm not saying I agree 100% with everything that Schofield has in the footnotes, but it's one of the best Schofield, one of the best reference Bible I know anything about. I've been using it for 40 some odd years, and it's used by most fundamental Bible believing preachers over the land and Christians, and I highly recommend it that you might get you a good King James Version Bible and follow me in the scriptures and give you the page number. Now, page number 37 from the book of Genesis, verse uh, 63. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at evening tide and lift up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. Behold, the camels were coming. Now, I won't take the time today to go back and review all that I said last Sunday. If I did, I wouldn't have time to say anything new today. I want to kind of take up where I left off last Sunday. We told you how that the servant of Abraham went back to the land from which they came to find a bride from among their own relatives that he might bring this bride back to Isaac. Now Abraham did not want Isaac to marry a heathen woman out of the land of Canaan among the Canaanites. He wanted him to marry a woman from their own relatives. And so he went back to find this woman Abraham said, Isaac is not going back there. He did not want Isaac to go back because he might uh, uh, like it there and want to remain there. And he wanted him with him. That may be one reason. Another reason is in the type you find that Isaac is not seen after the sacrifice on Mount Moriah in chapter 22 until he saw the camels coming in the field. You have him mentioned again. And so he should remain there until uh, the rapture. That's a type. Now Jesus is now coming soon to catch out the waiting bride. Behold, the camels are coming. We're very near home. It won't be long until our great Isaac will step out of heaven in the air with a great shout and the voice of the archangel and God will catch out the waiting bride to meet him in the air. Beautiful, beautiful types here in the Book of Genesis chapters 22 and 24. You need to make a study of them and be a blessing to your heart. Now this servant Abraham sent to get the bride for Isaac, of course, uh, we believe to be Eliezer. Eliezer means God's helper. And he's a beautiful type of the Holy Spirit. So we begin today with thought number four, and that is the servant did not speak of himself. Now, when this servant went to secure this bride for Isaac, he didn't brag on himself. He didn't say, I want you to see who I am. Let me tell you about myself. He was constantly bragging on Abraham and on Isaac, of course. He told of the wealth of Abraham. And he told how Isaac was to fall heir to all he had. He said to Rebekah, the woman he carried back for Isaac, he said, now, this man Isaac is a wealthy man. His father is very wealthy. And he's to fall heir to all the wealth of his father. Isaac, a type of Jesus. Abraham, a type of God the Father. So when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost to secure a bride for Christ, he didn't come bragging on himself. At any time you find people bragging on themselves, saying this is the Holy Ghost, this is the Holy Spirit, they're in the flesh. It's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't brag on himself. He brags on Jesus. In John chapter 16, verses 13 through 15, it says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he'll guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things the Father hath of mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. So the Holy Spirit has spent his time since the day of Pentecost when he came to take over in the place of Jesus, bragging on the Lord Jesus, revealing to us the truths of God from the Scriptures, never bragging on himself. The Spirit of God doesn't do that. So we find this servant here did not brag on himself. He bragged on Abraham and on Isaac, not on himself. And then we find in our fear thought, this line of thought, she had to be willing to go. Now remember he crossed the desert many, many miles back to this country which Abraham came, where he and Sarah came from. And then he goes to get this woman for a bride for Isaac. And he's very prayerful. We told you that last Sunday. He wants to be sure 
that he's received the right one, that she is the one for Isaac. He's very careful about that. And we told you about how that she drew water for him and for his camels. And she's very industrious. And, and she was a busy woman, not a lazy person. She's a fine, clean, virtuous maiden. And there he found this woman. And then he talked with her parents about her going back with him across the desert back to Abraham's camp many, many miles, some 500 miles across the desert back to the land where Abraham would be waiting along with Isaac. And of course, they talked with her about it. And they said, now it's up to her. If she's willing to go back with you and marry Isaac, then that's entirely up to her. Now we find in verse 8 of Genesis chapter 24, If the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Now Abraham said, when you go to find this bride for my son Isaac, if the woman is not willing to come, then we're clear of the oath. And in verse 15, they called Rebekah and said unto her, Will thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. Now whenever he talked with her parents, whenever Eliezer talked with the household, the members of the household, and they, then he had to approach her, and then he had to ask her the question, Are you willing to go with me back across the desert to meet a man you've never seen and marry a man you've never seen? Are you willing to do that? And she said, I will go. She was willing to go. Now, in a type here, this is a picture of the Holy Spirit convicting that sinner of his sin, showing him his need of Christ, letting him know he's on the road to hell, he needs to be saved. And then that sinner has to come to the place where he says, I am willing to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. God never forces or God never saves anyone against their will. Before God will save you against your will and force you to be saved, God lets you die and go to hell. God has planned and made a way whereby you can be saved. And when the Spirit of God begins to speak to you, then you must be willing to accept Jesus Christ as, uh, as your Savior or you'll die without God. Remember, God just don't save people against their will. One day God spoke to my heart. I had to become willing to accept Christ as my Savior. And that I did. You that know God today, there was a time in your life when God spoke to you. And you had to be willing to accept Christ as your Savior. And you did. And so she was willing to go. She turned away from mother and home and father. And father man until now was a stranger to her. She knew not this man she was going to marry. She knew not the man that came to secure her and take her back across the desert. She knew him not. Only met him at the well, drew water for him and his camels. And then, of course, she had to be willing to go with this man she knew very little about and go all the way across the desert and meet a man to marry a man she had never seen. Now, the Bible plainly tells us that we love the Lord Jesus, having not seen him, we love him. Now, I love Jesus today if I know my heart. If you're saved, then the love of God shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit, and you love him. You have never seen him, but you love him. If you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, there's something wrong. If you don't love Jesus, then there's a possibility you're not even saved. The only way a person can love Jesus is by the Holy Spirit being in their hearts, and the love of God then is shed abroad in their heart by the Holy Spirit. And she had never seen Isaac. He's a type of the Lord Jesus. And yet she was going to marry a man she had never laid eyes on. One of these days you're going to meet a man that you have never seen. If you're alive at the rapture, you'll meet him in the air. If you go before the rapture, then you'll see him then. You've never seen him, but you'll love him. Now the Holy Spirit is leading us across the desert. And this woman, Rebecca, had to be willing to say goodbye, mother. Goodbye, daddy. Goodbye, brothers. I'm on my way across the desert to meet a man, to see a man, to marry a man that I have never seen before. And so she was willing to go. 
And so the Holy Spirit today is leading us across the desert. The Holy Spirit is leading us to meet that Isaac that will be coming in the air. Now I want you to just use your imagination for a moment. Here goes a caravan of camels, some ten camels and the servants, and they'll ease our across the desert. On one of the back of those camels is riding one of the most beautiful women of that day. Her name was Rebecca, and she's riding across that desert, and she's very anxious to know more about Isaac and more about Abraham. Eliezer didn't talk about everything under heaven, uh, beloved, that he could think of. He talked about Isaac. He talked about Abraham and the wealth of Abraham and what was in store for them at the end of life's journey. Now the Bible tells us here in verses 22 and 53, she's presented with gifts by the servant. Now whenever the servant asked her about going and so forth, coming back with him, then he gave her some gifts. The servant had gifts that he carried with her, with him rather, across the desert when he went to find the bride for Isaac. He had those gifts. Abraham gave him those gifts and said, now you take those gifts with you. And when you find the right person, you present them to her. And so he found that right person. And when he found the right person, he presented her with gifts, silver and gold and earrings, bracelets, raiment and whatnot. He was well equipped there to provide her with whatever she loved and needed, and that he did. When she said, I will go with you across the desert, he takes the gifts and he gives her the bracelets. The bracelets to be put on the hand, to, the hand is to serve God. He gives her the earrings to place on her ears that she might hear the voice of God as God speaks and uh, bracelets and earrings and, and raiment placed on her body, which is a type of the imputed righteousness of the Spirit of God that God clothes us in when we come to know Him as our Savior. You remember when the prodigal son came home in Luke chapter 15? The father put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and a robe on his back. The father went into the closet, and there he secured the best robe in the wardrobe. And there he brought it out. And the father himself placed that robe on the prodigal son. He didn't say to one of the men of the field, the men of the house, I want you to take this and put it on my son that's been dead and now he's alive. I want you to bring that robe to me. And the best robe was brought to the father. And the father took that best robe and put it on his son, that prodigal son. That's a type of the Holy Spirit of God, of God the Father, imputing unto us His own divine righteousness, and then we're clothed in the righteousness of God. So you have on God's robe of righteousness today if you're saved. And so now she's equipped with silver and gold and jewels of gold and earrings and bracelets and raiment, and she's ready now to travel across the desert. She's well equipped. It's been supplied by Eliezer. Now, when God saves you, God doesn't turn you loose to make it the best way you can. God promises to give you the comforter. God promises you a great teacher. God promises you one that will be in you and with you. that will never leave you, nor forsake you. God promises to seal you with the Spirit of God. God promises you these things whenever you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Then God gives them to you. These gifts then comes to you by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost that gives you the various gifts that God wants you to have. And every child of God has a gift. You'll just find out what it is and use it to the glory of God. God may give you more gifts. Now the Bible says you don't come behind in any gift. God said to the church at, at Corinth there, and that was the most worldly church that you find in the Bible. And they did not come behind in any gift. They were gifted. Now you have natural ability. You have natural gifts. You have gifts that God can give you as you sojourn as a Christian. You don't have to sit around twiddle your thumbs and say, well, I would like to do something for God, but nothing I can do. Yes, there are. There's something you can do for God. You could be a prayer warrior. You could be faithful in serving God. 
You can be a witness. You can tell people how God saved you. Uh, maybe you might be able to help out in the choir or the congregation of singing. You can give of your tithes and offers. There's a lot of things you can do for God if you would. You have the gifts and the talent and the ability to do it if you'd only do it. And the more you use what you have, the more God will give you to use as you sojourn for him. And so she was loaded with gifts. Like every child of God, when he gets saved, he has those gifts. As he begins to grow, he develops them and uses them to God's glory. And many people today have many gifts to the glory of God. You need to find out what your gift is. You may say, preacher, could you name another two? Yes, that's what you call the gift of helps. The Bible speaks about the gift of helps. Always willing to help somebody in some way. Helping God's children, encouraging God's children, speaking the word of kindness, and doing what you can to help people along the way. You can develop your personality to be helpful in the work of God. That's a gift of helps. That's a gift of mercy. You don't hear people talk about the gift of mercy very much, but that's a gift of mercy. Many gifts that God has for his people if you went in to use them. But God's not going to bestow gifts upon a lazy church member they won't use the one he already has. God wants to give them to those who'll use them. And God will give you gifts as you sojourn if you really want to develop your gifts. And so he gave you the gifts. Now we find number seven. The servant's work is done. He's not eager to be on his way. Verse 54. Send me away to my master. Now he's ready to go. He's done the job. He's found the bride. And he's ready to go. He's found the right person. No doubt in his mind about it. He found the right person. He knows that with shadow of a doubt. Without that shadow of a doubt, he's ready to go. He says, send me away. But wait a minute. She has a brother by the name of Laban. Laban was not the most honest person in the world. Later on, he gave Jacob a lot of trouble when Jacob married his daughter. But here we find that Laban said, now wait a minute. Don't let her rush off. Uh, let her hang around about 10 more days and then let her go. Now what Laban wanted was some more gifts. He'd like to have some more gifts out of the satchel of Eleazar. He had been giving out gifts to the family. And Laban would like to have another gift or two. So he said, let her stay 10 days. And then, then after 10 days, then she can go. Now he's a type of the outward man. He's a type of the flesh. He's a type of the flesh that tells you, don't get in a big hurry about serving God. Don't be too faithful in serving God. Don't be too sacrificial. You've got plenty of time. You're young. You just kindly take it easy. And don't be a fanatic for God because you got a long time to live. And, and just take it easy. You've got plenty of time to serve God. Now that's old Laban speaking to you. You may not have much time to serve God. You could be out in the mortuary tomorrow. So could I. We need to realize we have no promise tomorrow, no lease on life, and you better start serving God right now. If you haven't been serving the Lord, now is the time to really start serving God. So Laban said, hang around about 10 more days. And the old flesh will tell you now, don't get in a big hurry. Like Pharaoh said, let the people go, but leave your cattle behind. Leave your wife and children behind. Let the men alone go out in the, in the wilderness and worship God. But we find Moses said, I'm going to take the wives, I'm taking the children, I'm taking the cattle, I'm going to carry my pocketbook, I'm taking everything I have to worship God. And you have a lot of church members, they're holding out on God. They don't mind coming to the house of God and worshiping God if you won't mention them giving of their tithes and offers. They don't like that. They rebel against that, some of them, and they rob themselves and short circuit the power of God in their lives. And they're the loser. They don't like to hear it. Don't want to preach it. Preach on it. But you must preach and let them know. So when you come to the end of life journey. They find out they have no reward. They can't blame the preacher. Blame nobody but themselves. And so we find the old flesh says just don't do it. Don't be faithful. No need of you bothering about the Wednesday night prayer meeting. Uh, just sit at home and warm your feet at the fire and look at TV. No need of you to go to prayer meeting on Wednesday night. Just be a small crowd there. And after all, they're studying the Bible. After all, you're not interested in that. So why be bothered about coming? You're not only that, but they're going to pray and you're not interested in that. Why go pray? 
See, a lot of church members listen to the flesh. They, they say, well, I, I'm a little tired. Well, God can help you. Everybody works today, gets tired, you know. If all of us use that excuse, none of us would be here on Wednesday night. So you just sit back and listen to the flesh. Flesh said, you sit at home now and you can get the news and watch TV. You got a special program. Don't get upset about the Wednesday night service because only a few there. You're not going to have many people can think about being there, the house of God, loving God. You just stay at home, love yourself. And that's what you do. You listen to Laban. You sit at home and you love yourself and you love what you have at home. And you listen to your body because it's a little tired. You say, well, I'm going to prop my feet up and take it easy. Well, you're going to be the loser as certain as you're hearing this preacher today. You ought to sacrifice on Wednesday night to be in God's house. You ought to be there. Keep the doors open, the glory of God. Now, he's ready to go back, and he kept telling about Abraham and Isaac. And one great thing about Eliezer is this. Eliezer knows the way back across the desert. Now, no doubt, Rebecca said, do you know the way all the way back to the land of Canaan? Where are we going? For there are the Chaldees back to the land of Canaan. Oh, yes. I've crossed this desert. I know every foot of the way. Don't worry. And she said, I'm going to trust you, servant, to get me safely across from the land of Canaan, or rather from the land of Ere the Chaldees, the land of Canaan, and I want you to guide me across. He said, turn everything over to me. I'll see that you get there. Now, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit says to the child of God. He says, turn everything over to me, and I'll see that you make it through. I'll give you strength. I'll help you learn the Bible. I'll help you to pray. I'll give you comfort. I'll give you guidance. The Holy Spirit says, now quit trying to do this within your own street. Just turn everything over to me and I'll help you. That's what the Spirit of God said to you. That's what he's saying to me. So now he's coming at journey's end. Now notice what happened at the journey's end. Isaac was watching. Look at verse 63. Isaac went out to meditate in the field at evening tide and lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels are coming. Hallelujah. Ten of those camels, they were coming. This man Isaac had gone out in the cool of that evening there, gazed across that desert land. No doubt he said, I wonder when that servant will be back with my bride. I can hardly wait. I wonder when those camels will appear on the scene. On this particular afternoon or evening, that handsome man is walking out in the field and gazing around. And lo and behold, he spotted something he'd been looking for. And what he spotted was those camels and Eliezer and the servants and that beautiful bride riding on one of those camels. And the Bible said he went to meditate and he saw him coming. And when Rebecca saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. When she saw that Isaac, she said to um, the servants, that, Who is that man coming across the field? Oh, he said, that's the man you're to marry. That is Isaac. And the Bible says she lighted off of that camel. She jumped off of that camel, or they helped her off of that camel. She put a veil over her face. She got ready to meet the man she was to marry. The servant tells her who the man is in the field, verse 65. And she meets him in the field. That's not without great significance. She meets him in the field. That's why God is going to meet his bride. He's going to lift us up from the field. He's coming in the air and take us out of the field. And we're going to meet him in the air. He meets her in the field. The field here is a type of the world. And when Jesus comes back at the rapture, he's coming back to the world. Down here in the air. And then he's going to bring us out to meet him in the air. So she meets him in the field. She covers the face of the veil. And then the wedding takes place. Verse 67. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. And took Rebekah and she became his wife. And he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Oh beloved the Bible said he loved her. See God knew exactly the woman that Isaac wanted. All of his life he had dreamed of this beautiful Rebekah. He knew exactly the kind of woman that he wanted. And when she appeared on the scene, that was it. And God knew the kind of man that she wanted for a husband. And when she saw him in the field, he was a man she had dreamed about from a little girl. And there they fell madly in love with each other. 
And that's what happens between that sinner and Jesus. The Holy Ghost brings us together. And then we fall in love with Jesus. And he loves us. And we're brought together by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible said, Then Isaac carried her into his mother's tent. His mother had died. And she's a type of the nation of Israel. I won't have time to get into that. And they go into the tent. And there they, uh, while in the tent, he, the Bible said they uh, loved each other. That was their home. And she took the place of his mother in his life, of course. And they were very happy. And they loved each other. Now in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 8, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The Holy Spirit, Eliezer, is right now, right now calling out a bride for Christ. We are very near to the field where Isaac will be walking out to meet us. Our great Isaac, the Lord Jesus Christ, we're very close home. Ever since the day of Pentecost, we've been crossing the desert. Crossing the Holy Spirit's led us in Pentecost almost for 2,000 years. He's led us across the desert. We're almost at the place now where our eyes is going to appear in the clouds. First Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us what's going to happen. They will be caught up to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. If you're not saved and you need to get in right now, is the time to get in. Tomorrow could be too late. And I trust you'll get in. Now I brought you message number two. Behold, the camels are coming. Last Sunday, message number one. Today, message number two. They are taped 305, 306. They're available for $3 for each tape. May God bless you if you write in for them. Let us all stand our feet, will you please? Dear Father in heaven, I pray today that you use the message. Thank you, Father, greater Isaac, the Lord Jesus is coming, and we'll meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with him. Thank you for the Holy Spirit today that's now guiding us across the desert, as it were, our great Eliezer, God's helper. Be with us, our Father. Have your own way through this message today in the hearts of multitudes. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, Trace is going to play for us on the organ. While she's playing, if you're unsaved, off your backslidden, or you're looking for a church home, or if you need to come forward for any reason, I want you to obey the Spirit of God. Would you obey God while she plays? If you need to come forward for any reason, would you come while we wait? Wait. 